सेव किया था ना मैं सिर्फ इसलिए गया था क्योंकि उसने मुझे कॉल किया दैट्स इट बट लिसन तो सेव इट फॉर समवन एल्स जिंदगी में सेव करना जरूरी है मगर जब बात पैसों की हो सिर्फ सेविंग से काम नहीं चलेगा इक्विटी म्यूचुअल फंड्स में इन्वेस्ट कीजिए और अपने सेविंग्स को आगे बढ़ने का मौका दीजिए म्यूचुअल फंड इन्वेस्टमेंट्स आर सब्जेक्ट टू मार्केट रिस्क रीड ऑल स्कीम रिलेटेड डॉक्यूमेंट्स केयरफुली एन अनएक्सपेक्टेड क्राइसिस हैज रीजन फॉर द इंडियन आर्मी और मे बी मे बी इट शुड नॉट हैव बीन सो अनएक्सपेक्टेड बिकॉज वेन Indian Army decided, or Indian Armed Forces or Government of India, Modi government decided to bring in the Agni Pat scheme. Then it could have been anticipated, or should have been anticipated, that there will be a problem with the recruitment of Gurkha soldiers from Nepal in the Indian Army. Now this is a complexity, and that is the reason that is what justifies this episode of Cut the Clutter. why should there be a particular issue with the recruitment of gorkhas in the indian army because of agnipat scheme and dare to gorkhas who originate from nepal or the nepalese nepalese gorkhas just to clarify a small thing editors in old days unlike us editors in old days used to be very finicky about their choice of words and descriptions we also try but we can't be as much of perfectionists often because maybe we write too much or we speak too much or maybe we are just not good enough but bg vargis uh, who used to be my editor at the indian express in early 80s he would say always make a distinction between a nepali speaker who's indian of indian origin and a nepali who comes from nepal so in his style book a nepali nepali speaker from india or ethnic nepali from india was called nepali so plural nepalis whereas people who came from nepal they were the nepalese now you can argue whether this is right or wrong but that is the pattern that was followed so i'll follow the same pattern as the teacher taught you so the, why should the problem arise especially with the recruitment of the nepalese into the indian army there is no problem with the re- recruitment of ethnic nepalis in the indian army so it's not as if nepali speakers have an issue with the agnipat scheme but the nepalese have an issue now this has got complicated by the fact that for 3 years now this is the third year that indian armed forces haven't re- recruited for 2 years there was no recruitment either in the indian army or in the nepalese army for that matter because of covid right so indian army has been running a backlog vacancies have been rising soldiers have been retiring from gurkhar regiments by themselves more than 12000 soldiers have retired in these two couple of years so those vacancies have to be filled even if the army is not expanding once again there are people getting older so you need newer people newer soldiers then they are trained there's a time to their training they're coming into the army so recruitment has to take place the government of nepal on the other hand has now said you that you cannot recruit soldiers or recruits from nepal under the agnipat scheme and they have multiple objections to that what that has done is that has thrown completely out of kilter the indian army's plans to top up the numbers in their gurkha regiments gurkha regiment is the largest of the infantry regiments in indian army in fact so large that gurkha regiment is not one regiment it is actually seven regiments there are seven regiments of gurkhas which amongst themselves have about 40 battalions i will give you some details but 40 battalions that makes them the largest regimental group in the indian army and definitely a very large section of indian army's infantry which are the who are the foot soldiers who are the cutting edge of any armed force now indian army has also had a love affair with gurkha troops for a long time not just from british times the gurkha troops first came into service of an authority ruling india unfortunately at that point east india company in the in very early 19th century 1814 15 16 in that and in that era but since then gurkha soldiers have served in india after partition they been an essential part of indian army and also they are the pride of indian army now indian army faces an issue and the issue is that nepalese government says and there been many negotiations nepalese prime minister was also in india pushp kamal dahal prachanda he was in delhi there were again talks but nepal government has 
put its foot down and they say you cannot recruit Nepalese soldiers, their citizens under the Agnipath scheme. What are their objections? Their objections are basically two. One, that Nepalese soldiers serve in the Indian Army and in the British Army based on an agreement that was signed at the time of Indian independence, 1947-48. There was a tripartite agreement between the British government, that is the colonialists on their way out, the colonial power on its way out, the Indian government, which was, which was a kind of inheritor state, but also a state that was getting back independence, and also government of Nepal, which had always remained sovereign, even in British times. Although they worked very closely with the British, they lost a big war, a series of wars. After a series of wars, they lost to the British. They signed a treaty, the Treaty of Sugoli in 1816. As a result of the Treaty of Sugoli, large territories that include Sikkim, Darjeeling, large parts of Tarai or large parts of what today falls under Uttarakhand, also some of the territories the Nepalese are now claiming as theirs. Remember, they had changed their maps just a while back when Oli was prime minister and they passed those new maps uh, unanimously in, in, in their parliament. So some of those territorial issues go back to the Treaty of Sugoli which the Nepalese had lost to East India Company. But even after losing that, East India Company made peace with the rulers of Nepal. They never took away their sovereignty because East India Company knew that a sovereign Nepal in any case was a buffer between them and the Chinese power. At the same time, the Nepalese, the Nepalese ruling clan at that point, they also reached out to the British and they provided services to the British mostly by way of lending their troops to them. So they let the British recruit from Nepal. Not just that, in 1857, when East India Company was really in a bad way in Meerut, Delhi, the siege of Delhi was continuing for a long time, and Lucknow. The garrison of Lucknow was under siege and the East India Company and the British officers and their fa families were suffering severely. Then in Meerut and Delhi, East India Company heavily deployed Gorkha troops. These were Gorkha troops in their service. But to lift the siege of Lucknow, the then ruler of Nepal, he came in with 11 regiments of his army. So his army and then his successor, his older brother who later became his successor. After that, the British East India Company ceased to exist after 1857 and the British themselves began recruiting a lot of Gurkhas in the Indian Army. One little distinction they made, however, you know, the British. The British always played the game of identity. We say divide and rule, but the British actually played a game of identity. So the British said that much of the rebellion was sparked by upper caste Hindus. Upper caste Hindus, Brahmins, Bangal Pandey, remember? So they said that now we can no longer trust the loyalties of upper caste Hindus. So they reached out to the ruling family of Nepal and they said, can you help us recruit more of your Gurkhas, not from the caste Hindu communities or not from the Hinduized communities, but from among the Magar and Gurung tribes. And that's when a large number of Magars and Gurungs were recruited. So interestingly, the regiments in the Indian Army, Gurkha regiments in the Indian Army, also by and large have followed that split as well. Now, this is a lot of it's got mixed up over time, but the basic split remains. And I will give you some of those examples as we go along. Now, those battalions. Now, what happened was when partition came, then the question of Gorkha troops came in. At the time of partition, during the Second World War, British Army, British Indian Army, it was always called Indian Army, never called British Indian Army, but I'm just using that description. The Indian Army and the British became really bloated during the Second World War. It was a World War Army. After that, it might have been scaled down or downsized. A lot of people were demobbed. But the fact is that 47, when the partition took place and independence came, at that point, there were 10 regiments of Gurkha soldiers. So 10 Gurkha regiments each one having two battalions. They were then given the option of either going to India or going to Britain. Much to the Britain's surprise and much to the Britain's dismay because they loved Gurkha troops. They thought, Are, well, I ja rahe. we are all going to UK, we'll all be serving UK, right? So all the Gurkha troops will opt for UK. That didn't happen. Four regiments 
opted for UK, six regiments opted for India. Now the reasons you can understand, this was proximity to their country. Also, also under the tripartite agreement that British government, Indian government and the Nepalese government signed, the Nepalese soldiers recru recruited either by India or by, or by Britain. They were to get their compensation according to set principles. So, this, so the Nepalese recruited in Indian armed forces were to get, say, get the same benefits, pay and benefits as the native Indians recruited in the Indian armed forces. Those who opted for Britain, now they were not going to get the same pay, pay and benefits as native British soldiers. They were still going to get the same pay and benefits as their counterparts in the Indian army, but, but because they were given cost of living allowances, they were also giving relocation, etc. and many other benefits, they got paid a lot more. Over time, however, the number of these regiments under the British army, Gorkha regiments, dwindled. They are now left with one regiment and two battalions. So while in the British army, the number of Gurkhas, the Gurkha regiments came down, they are now reduced to only two battalions. Although, mind you, when push comes to the shove, very often you will find Gurkha troops being used. In India, these numbers started rising and have kept on increasing and I will give you the split in just a minute. Now, what exactly was this tripartite agreement? I am sharing a link with you. You can read the whole agreement if you are, if you are inclined that way. But basically, this agreement said several things. Number one, very important. That, the, that these troops, they may be born Nepalese, they may be Nepalese citizens serving in the British Army or in the Indian Army, but they will not be described as mercenaries. Now, how would that be? Because they were soldiers working for money. So, under Geneva Con Convention in Section 47 or Article 47 of Geneva Conventions, in fact, under many provisions of that section, these Gurkha soldiers or Nepalese soldiers serving in the British or the Indian Army would qualify to be called as mercenaries. But they, they were not called as mercenaries because they were given a specific exemption under subsection or subclause E of that article of Geneva Conventions. It is the same subsection 47E which also gave a similar exem exemption to the French Foreign Legion. French Foreign Legion also recruited from other countries to serve internationally as well. Now, there were some other important elements in that tripartite agreement which the Nepalese government, Nepal government is now accusing India of violating. They say if you implement the Agnipat scheme. So, first of all, they say, oh, under the agreement, under, under the three-way agreement or tripartite agreement, it was said that Nepalese soldiers will continue to get the same benefits and pay as the Indian soldiers. So they say, with Agnipath, you've changed that. Now the answer to that is, look, it's changed for everybody. So the treaty said that Nepalese soldiers will get the same pay and benefits as Indian soldiers. Now Indian soldiers are in the, on the Agnipath track, so are your soldiers. The treaty did not say, say that your soldiers or recruited or those will continue to get the same pay and benefits and service conditions as they did in the past. Is it as it is, exists today? So that's the argument and counter argument. The other things that the Nepalese complain about, they say that, look, we had said, the tripartite treaty also said that these soldiers should be of no threat to the Nepalese security and sovereignty, right? So again, your answer would be, so... Nepalese soldiers have been serving in the Indian Army for such a long time. In fact, so many have served in the Indian Army that at, that at this point there are 2 lakh, 2 lakh, 200,000 pensioners of Indian Army in Nepal. So if they've never been a threat to your sovereignty, why would these soldiers be a threat to your sovereignty? And why would that threat rise only because these are Agnipat soldiers? So the Nepalese say, look, that is the problem. Problem is the Agnipat scheme. Because you said, you said earlier that everybody served until a certain age. Now you say it's only four year service. So one year training, four year service, one year training, not all of it training, training, induction, etc. Four years of service. So in about five years, 75% of these well-trained 
people will be back in our population. Our population is still settling down from the Maoist wave. We have deep security problems. A lot of people, a lot of people are still unemployed. We will not be able to re-employ these people, but because they will be trained in the use of firearms, etc., they'll be trained soldiers. They can be a threat to our sovereignty. Once again, now solutions are being debated. Can they also be re-employed? Like Indian Agni Veers after they finish their four years into say Indian paramilitary forces. Those are issues that are being debated. But the fact is that as a result of this, Nepal is not allowing the recruitment of any more troops from its territory in the Indian Army. And that has caused a crisis. And why does it cause a crisis? Look at the size of the Gurkha contingent in the Indian Army. In the Indian Army now, there are seven regiments. Seven regiments of Gurkhas. It's the only one of the identity-based uh, elements of the Indian Armed Forces, which has multiple regiments. So it has seven regiments. Each regiment has several battalions. So when somebody says officer from 111 GR, what, what, it, what it means is it says 1 slash 11 GR. GR is for Gorkha rifles, rifles. It means 1st battalion of the 11th regiment of Gorkha rifles. Similarly, they can be 211GR, 311GR or 15GR or 18GR or, or 28GR. So each regiment has multiple battalions. At last count, the Gurkha battalions in the Indian Army spread across these seven regiments are about 40, right? I say about 40 because sometimes the number varies a little depending on depending on the super specialization in the role of some. For example, one of these 40 battalions right now is purely or fully an artillery battalion. It's not listed as a Gurkha battalion, but it's listed as purely as an artillery battalion. That is 64 field regiment. That's an artillery battalion. Similarly, similarly of these seven battalions under 8th regiment of Gurkha rifles, that is 78GR. 78GR is now called 1 by 8 MEC. That is 1 by 8 mechanized infantry. So every regiment of Indian Army has contributed initially as mechanized infantry was set up. Each regiment had one of its battalions convert into mechanized infantry. Gurkhas may be seven regiments, but one battalion out of those seven regiments has become a mechanized infantry. If you look at the rest, I will tell you the first regiment has six battalions. Third and the fourth regiments have five battalions each. 5th regiment has 6 battalions, 8th regiment has 6 battalions, one is mechanized infantry, 9th regiment has 5 battalions, 11th has 6 battalions. So all of these add up to 39. Again, as we told you, there is subtle and not so subtle identity distinction between these regiments as well. If you look at the 11th regiment, for example, 11th regiment, the largest right now, 7 battalions, 11th regiments mainly consists of recruits from the plains of Nepal. These are the Limbus, the Limbu tribe and they tend to be taller than the rest, right? So 11th regiment predominantly cons consists of, of the Nepalese recruits of the Limbus. Remember in every Gurkha regiment now the formula is very clear. 60% of the recruits come from Nepal, 40% are Indian Nepalis or Indian Gurkhas. So the 11th regiment of Gurkhas, which actually has seen a purple patch because India's first two chiefs of defense staff have both come from the 11th regiment. That is General Rawat and now General Anil Chauhan. Both are from 11 GR. General Rawat before this, before becoming CDS, also served as the chief of army staff. Gurkha regiments have given us three chiefs of army staff, including the most famous of them all, the first field marshal, Sam Manikshaw. So he was from 8th GR. And then General Darbeet Singh Sohag, much later, of 5th GR. So 8th and the 5th and the 11th have produced chiefs. The 11th in addition has produced both of India's chiefs of defense staff, the first and the second. So the 11th consists predominantly of the Limbu tribes, drawn from, recruited from the plains of Nepal. Then 5 and 8, 5 and 8 are predominantly Thapas and Magars. The 3rd and the ninth, they predominantly have Chetris. Chetris happen, happen to be Brahmins. Those are the ones, remember, the, who the British did not particularly want to have in their army because they were never sure of the 
अपर कास्ट हिंदू लॉयल्टीज एट दैट पॉइंट वेयर बाई लाइज अनदर स्टोरी द स्टोरी ऑफ मार्शल रेसिस इन इंडिया विच आई विल कम टू इन जस्ट ए मिनट एंड फाइनली द फर्स्ट एंड द फोर्थ रेजिमेंट्स रिस्पेक्टिवली consist of predominantly of the magars and the guru so within the gorkha regiments also there is an identity distinction made now in that fine balance suddenly if you cannot recruit from nepal where many of these tribes or many of these groups reside it causes an immediate problem these these regiments also have different training centers or regimental centers if you look at 58 i am very partial to 58 simply because i lived in shillong and 58 that is the regimental center for 5th and the 8th regiments that is located in shillong in a place called happy valley so 5th and the 8th so that center is called 5 by 8 gtc uh, gtc stands for gorkha training center similarly 11th is based in lucknow its regimental center one and the fourth are in sabathu in Him- himachal pradesh not far from kasoli or sanawar if you are going to shimla you can take a detour it's a pretty little hill station sabathu so the first and the fourth regiments are there and third and the ninth are in varanasi now i told you i'll bring you back to the martial races theory because that's a contribution that the british made to military science military history or the craft of military management in india martial races theory that some races are more capable of fighting in a battle than others or some people or some races some ethnicities some castes some religious groups are more suited to the battlefield than others i don't believe that any other country or any other society follows that principle but that is the principle that the british established in india and that endures even now now i'll give you some little slices of history in 1816 the anglo nepalese wars ended the wars went on from 1814 to 1816 it started on 1st of november 1814 ended on 4th of march 1816 with the treaty of sugoli that the british realized east india company realized that look these gorkhas are very tough soldiers uh, they are already trained soldiers there there isn't very much else happening in nepal for them to get jobs etc so why don't we recruit these soldiers and if we recruit these soldiers probably they will be that much of a nuisance for us in nepal or to that extent the ruler of nepal will have fewer trained people fighting for him so they raised their first regiments or first battalions of Gorkha soldiers like that in 1816 until 1816 they were fighting with the Nepalese in 1816 itself from among people that they were fighting they raised the first units of the Gorkha army and they said these are a martial race fantastic soldiers so they told them you are fantastic soldiers they paid them well they became their soldier then the number of Gorkha soldiers kept on rising in the East India Company's service and they fought many other battles with them or for them particularly in northwest frontier province against the pathans rebellious pathans in that area the the revolt of the pindaris for example gorkhas played a stellar, stellar role there then 1846 to 1848 the british because maharaja ranjit singh had now gone the six were divided so the british wanted the final prize that is the state of punjab the large state of punjab at that point and punjab at that point reached out to very large parts of the northern region so the british wanted that territory between 1845 and 1848 the british fought a series of wars with the six these were called anglo sikh wars 1846 to 1848 1846 one of the most decisive and bloodiest battles of that war was the battle of mudki and the battle of mudki the british won but they suffered very heavily after that battle they reached out to the six and they said you are such such, such good soldiers why aren't you joining our army so they raised their first sikh units after the battle of mudki in 1848 the final battles in the anglo sikh wars the two year anglo sikh wars took place at the end of which the sikh power was defeated and the british took over punjab as they took over punjab after they had defeated the sikh power they had massacred lots and lots of sikh troops and, and a lot of sikh troops had fought to the last man last round in that situation they fought very bravely suffered very heavy heavy casualties the british again said that look why don't you join our army so see how an empire is built an empire is built not just on divide and rule but it's also built on the basis of co-opting those who fight you so 1816 they co-opted the gurkhas because they had fought them 
1846 to 1848, they co-opted the Sikhs who had fought them. Against the Sikhs now, Gurkhas were faithful to them. Then again, when the first Indian War of Independence, as we call it, took place in 1857, both the Gurkhas and the Sikhs fought alongside the British as their loyal soldiers. And then, as I told you, after that, the British said that they were not so inclined to hire upper caste Hindus, etc. because they had suffered badly in 1857. They are the ones who had revolted. So they shifted their emphasis of recruitment, say, into, the, into Western Punjab with the Punjabi Muslim population. The Sikhs, the Gurkhas, the mountain ethnicities, Gadwalis, Komaunis, who had not fought them. And overnight, they declared all of them to be martial races. That's where the origins of the martial races theory lie. And the nastier and uglier, but purely factual element of the martial races theory was that people who actually fought against the East India Company in 1857, these were people from Bihar. These were people from Eastern UP, some from Bengal. They were, they were then maligned for being effeminate, for not being martial enough. But they are the ones who were dared to challenge the British power. They were now maligned for not being martial enough. And those who had stayed loyal to the British power, they were anointed as martial races. That was also a way of keeping those who had dared to revolt against East India Company out of the armed forces. So I mentioned that fact, if only to underline this completely fake idea and completely self-serving fake idea of martial races that the British had built because it suited them at that point of time. And how nasty the British were, this was East India Company. After East India Company came the crown directly. How nasty they were, General Dyer, when he had to fire at Indians in Jallianwala Bagh, he did not use any of the British troops to do it. He was just a British commander ordering them. The troops he selected were hand-picked troops who he thought whose loyalty he would not distrust. Only 50 soldiers. 50 soldiers of which 25 were Gurkhas. 25 were Gurkhas. Then there were soldiers from Western Punjab frontier, mainly what was then called as Punjabi Musliman, that category. Some from Sindh. These 50 soldiers were given Lee and field rifles and were told to fire non-stop at this crowd. He had a couple of armored cars with machine guns also, but they could not go into the narrow streets leading up to Jallianwala Bagh. So he used only Indian troops in that action. At the same time, you can't take away from the fact that each one of these regiments, units, elements has done marvelous service for India and has built great colorful traditions for themselves, inclu including the Gurkha regiments, which amongst themselves, besides three army chiefs, also account for three Paramvir Chakras.